Welcome everyone to this Varvel Pain Society social media live and thank you for joining us. I'm Sharon Goulbert, Varvel Pain Society trustee, therapist and pain science educator. Please do say hi in the comments if you're watching live. I can see there's a few of you already watching, but just to make sure that you can hear me nice and clearly and everything is coming through clearly too. And remember, as we go along today, you can pop your questions in the chat box in the comments too. And oh, hi, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Great. Good to good to see you. Uh, we've got Kay Thomas from the Bubble Pain site in the background on Facebook. I'll also keep an eye on those comments and on YouTube comments too. So if you see my eyes wandering around a bit, it's just me checking the comments. Hello, thank you for joining us, everyone. So one of our most popular live streams from 2021 was how the vagina and vulva are affected by menopause with GP, clinical sexologist and menopause specialist, Dr. Angela Wright. Today, I am happy to say Dr. Angela is back with us to build upon that and discuss sexual problems and menopause. Hi, Angela, how are you doing? Hello, I'm all right, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Our pleasure. We had to have you back. You were... <laughs> so popular last year and i can see that as the room is filling up with with viewers already so you know as we go through do pop in your questions as well into that chat box i know you've got quite a few slides to go through this time yeah i have it's exciting <laughs> well i um, can yeah i can talk for hours on this though <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what might be most useful. Um, I wonder, Angela, could you give us a, just a quick recap, and you're probably going to be covering this in more detail anyway, um, of some of the changes in the vulva and the vagina when we lose oestrogen um, and testosterone, and, and maybe you can build on from there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I often um, describe the vagina as being a bit like a self-cleaning oven. It's a um, a phrase I picked up from my colleague Angela Sharma and it's this idea that we're, we're just perfectly adapted um, during our fertile years for sex and when I say perfectly adapted we have excellent blood flow, we have stretchy thick tissues, they turn over quickly and repair after sex, our sensation is really acute so we can feel pleasure, um, the clitoral tissues you know get perfused with blood so everything is kind of set up and we lubricate really well and it's all like that because of the presence of estrogen and testosterone mm. and so when we go through menopause and we lose those hormones it has a really profound impact on the vagina the vulva and the bladder and it's associated with lots of problems um, that can impact on sexuality and just not make you feel particularly good either mm. Um, do you want to dive into your your presentation? Yeah, I think there's a there's a decent amount to get through. So as I said to you before, I'm quite happy for you to interrupt me with questions or clarifications. Um, but I will share my screen and get talking. Mm -hmm. So let me just get set up at this end. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully all of this will come through. Is that set up as it wants to be? There we go. Can you see that um, with my first yes, slide? Yes, you can see that. Um, and I think you're in presenter view, so we would just need the slideshow. We can see your presenter bits as well. Ah, uh, okay. Let me just stop sharing for a second, and I'll try that again. I don't know why that's done that. Bear with me. Share screen, <coughs> and let's go to the actual slides. So hopefully, it's giving me about four different options. But let's just see what happens with this one. <laughs> Is that any? better let's have a look yes perfect okay so it's to the side of me but i can look to, to both sides as i talk so this is um you know presentation it's probably 45 minutes of me talking about sexual problems and menopause and i could probably talk for longer because there's lots of stuff that, that goes on and causes us issues um so if i can just oh it's not advancing let me just do this again sorry um sharon i think i picked the wrong no one i'm just going to pick the one that seems to let me actually share it properly okay apologies is that working better now with my current slide and um, you need to go into slideshow because yes yeah, so i'm in slideshow here and 
So resume slideshow. There we go. Let's hope it advances this time. Yes, it does. OK, yes. got it? Yes. Let's start again. OK, so I'm now questioning who I am and why I'm here, because that's not started properly. But I'm, as you said, I am a, I'm a GP. I'm an ex-hospice doctor, worked in a hospice for 10 years. And, and I am something um, called a clinical sexologist, which sounds like a made up title, but it effectively means that I've done two years of psychosexual therapeutic um, training. And then I've also done training in the medical aspects of sexual dysfunction too, and taken a membership exam. And because I kept coming across sexual problems Problems in menopause, I then went on to do the British Menopause Society accredited um, menopause specialist training as well. And that's what I do for a chunk of my week now. I, I work partly in general practice, partly in a menopause PMDD and psychosex clinic over in Hull. And I also work online in a private clinic with my colleague Angela Sharma, which is called Spice for Health. And what I'm wanting to cover this evening is just to give everyone that's watching some idea of the way that we should try and look at sexual problems, because it's not just about what happens in your body or even in the vulva and the vagina. We need to look at it with a much wider lens. And I'm going to talk about some of the common problems that happen with sex as you go through menopause, whether that is a natural menopause, um, which can include early menopause. About one in 10 of us go through early menopause between 40 and 45. One in 100 of us will go through a premature menopause under the age of 40. And also different sorts of menopause, like a surgical menopause or the kind of menopause that's induced by the treatments we use for endometriosis. Um, and also cancer, because cancer can have a big impact on sexual function. And it does it with putting people into menopause a lot of the time. So it's relevant to what we're talking about. And I'm talking about problems, but I suppose I want to just um, pay reference to the fact that not every woman going through menopause will see it as a negative for her sexuality. Some, some women see it as quite freeing. And I'm using the word um, woman when I'm speaking, but I'm referring to anyone who was assigned female at birth. Yeah. So I'm going to start with some sex stats because nobody knows about anyone else's sex life and what people are up to. So the first thing to kind of pay reference to is that menopausal women are a changing demographic. We don't sort of stick on our cardigans and shuffle off at 55 now. We're actually we've got less married women, we're entering new relationships, so sexuality can have a bigger importance to many women that are going through menopause if they're dating than it might do in a long term relationship. Lots of people will be in non heteronormative relationships, different relationship structures. Um, and I think I wanted to get across that even people who are single still have sexuality. Having solo sexuality can be really important to, um, to people. So we shouldn't always assume that sex is only important if you're in a partnership. And we do studies in the UK of sexual habits and behaviours. We've got this thing called the NatSal study. Um, which is a UK-based study. And the last one was done, I think, in 2012. Um, and they're doing another one fairly soon. And what the figure showed us is that people continue to have all kinds of sexual activity as they get older. Um, but overall, it seems that we're having less sex than we did the last time they did the NatSal study, though we don't really know why. But sex is a marker of health. So being sexually active is correlated with quality of life and with better health scores. Um, and our sexual function correlates really closely to how happy and how satisfied we are with our life. And even though women report more sexual problems as they get older, actually, bizarrely, sexual satisfaction increases, which shows it's not always about the kind of obvious wins that you think you, you get with sexuality. And there's a lovely study um, that shows that if you have 100 orgasms a year, it's associated with an extended life expectancy, about another three to eight years of life. So there's a good reason to keep all this going. These are just some of the graphs that I've picked up from the NatSal study just to illustrate a little bit about what I'm talking about. The first ones just show that um, the proportion of people that have had sex in the last four weeks is higher in those that have got good health status. And the bottom charts show that we're having all sorts of different kinds of sex even as we get older. So big proportions of older um, women are still engaging in vaginal sex, oral sex and other sorts of contact. So it's not a minority activity. It's important to older people. And I think it's important to sort of recognise that and also to understand the prevalence of problems with sex. So about 50 percent of women reported a problem with their sexual function in the last year but only about 10% report being distressed by that. And there is similar figures in men as well. About one in six people will say that they've had issues and sought some support from healthcare professionals. 
But I've highlighted these figures just to say that although there are more people that are having problems with sexual function, only about one in five women will actually go and do something about it. So one of the reasons I've crammed a lot in tonight is I know that we only see the tip of the iceberg and that people often suffer in silence and feel you know, often devastating problems without doing anything about it and seeing, seeing a practitioner. I've also just put a slide in because sexual function problems can do correlate with sexual trauma. And I think it's just important to recognize that it's a prevalent problem. About a quarter of women will have experienced some form of sexual trauma and there's a positive association with problems. It's not always the case, but it's something that's worth us mentioning and talking about. And not all trauma is associated with sexual trauma. It can be, you know, um, trauma from childbirth, trauma from medical procedures, and all of these things can impact on our sexual function too. So the, I was trained, and I talked about this last time, I was trained um, with something called a biopsychosocial view of sex. And I remember talking about this with Winston and trying to explain what that meant. And doctors, certainly when I trained in medicine, we were trained in a biomedical model. So we were very much focused on what was happening in people's bodies and not widening it to what's happening in their minds and what's happening in, in their lives. And particularly when it comes to sexual problems, it's, in, it's incredibly important to, to widen your lens beyond what's happening in somebody's body. And it's what we know in practice that patients' lives and relationships and histories differ. And we have this false division between mental health and physical health and actually all sorts of other things impact our access to our sexuality. So our education around it, how easy it is for us to get help and, and advice, the messages that we grow up with when we're younger, the cultural religious messages around our sexuality, past experiences, relationship dynamics, all these things really impact on sexual function and sexual problems. And this is the this is doing the rounds on the internet, and I've just put it in because it reminded me of old style sex education. So just uh, hopefully nobody tonight has been exposed to this. Oh, we can't hear the sound on that. Ah, oh, that's a shame. It's got captions. What what she was saying in it really was that um, it was a it was a an indication of the messages that sometimes we're given when we're young about sex and whether we're giving sex positive messages or whether we're given things that make us think that there are certain rules or um, things that we should feel ashamed with with regard to our sexuality and these are some of the things that can really impact on how we experience our sexual function as we get older. And it becomes particularly relevant as we come into problems and we, and we get more of these problems as we go through menopausal changes. And we talk about this idea of having sexual scripts as sexologists. So we talk about the fact that we absorb sort of unspoken, unwritten rules um, about what's normal. And I, when I say what's normal, I mean, you know, what's normal in terms of how frequently we should want sex? What's normal in terms of the kind of sex that we have? Is it normal for older women to continue to want to be sexual or should we be sort of slinking off into the background at this stage? Um, and all of these things impact what patients perceive to be normal and desirable or a problem, but they also affect health practitioners. We carry this stuff into the room too. And sometimes mm -hmm. we won't, we don't validate patients' concerns because we have different expectations. So I think it's important to recognize these things when we're talking about sexual function. And some of the biggest sexual scripts that we have um, in our society are around what's normal in heterosexual sex. And many of the scripts that we have are the kind of things that make women feel that their bodies don't work properly. So I wanted to spend a sort of a, a second talking about some of them because it reflects what I see in clinic when I talk to um, patients. So there are myths around how women orgasm. Um, there are myths around the relative difficulty of female orgasm versus male orgasm and the importance of the penetrative part of sex versus other parts of sex. So just to give some figures, there's a big gap in orgasms in um, heterosexual sex. Both men and women can usually climax within minutes in solo sex, but when we put them into partnered sex, we see that the male orgasm rate stays at 95%, but the female orgasm rate drops to about 65. And when we put them into casual sex, that rate drops down to about 18%. And when we see women in, in relationships with other women, the rate is much higher. So it's just a good example of how 
a lot of what can go wrong with sexual function isn't necessarily to do with how your body's working. It can be to do with expectations and norms and behaviors. And sometimes we don't think about those things very much, but they are really relevant to sexual problems. So when I use a biopsychosexual um, lens and somebody comes to me and tells me that something has gone wrong with sex, what I'm effectively trying to do is think, well, what changes have you noticed in your body? And at menopause, we're gonna talk about lots of the changes that can go on. I want to ask them what's going on in their mind and how they're feeling in themselves because it's quite a big transition for women as well as we go from fertile to the infertile stage of life and that can have meaning and significance. And it's also important to know what's going on in their home and in their relationship um, and in their, in their sort of dynamic with their partners and work and things as well, because all those things can impact. But when it comes to what are the things that can go wrong, well, there's four pillars that we build our sexual function on. It's stuff that it's the sexual function in our body to so the things that, that the wiring, the blood supply, the nerves and things that make our sexual response happen. It's our sexual identity, so the kind of concept of ourselves as sexual, our sexual mm -hmm. relationship, which is who we choose to express our sexuality with or who we're able to express it with. And then just our wider body, because our flexibility, our, the presence of pain, whether we have saliva, whether our touch and smell and things work properly, all of that impacts us as well. So I'm going to take us through those things one by one, really, and then um, give some examples of the things that we can do at the end. So if we take the first two things together, so the, the sort of wiring of our sexual response and our body and the things that can go wrong with our body around menopause and midlife, we're back to the bits that I was talking about at the beginning, these adaptations um, in our bodies that are designed to help us to reproduce. And I think it's difficult to overestimate quite how ingeniously the body is designed to help us to reproduce. We have additional blood supply to our breasts when we're fertile, so we can, we can feel arousal, we can feel pleasure there. We have different wiring in our brain that helps to kind of coordinate our sexual interest and it, and it maps it. So when our hormone levels are highest and we're ovulating, we're more receptive and interested in sex and we, we can map people's behavior to that part of their cycle. And the vagina and the vulva are absolutely adapted to cope with um, penetration and to cope with the little, what we call micro traumas, the little bits of damage that might be done from sexual activity. The lining of the um, vagina turns over every four hours and it repairs itself. The blood supply is fantastic. So any um, damage you know, is, is dealt with immediately. We have a low vaginal pH, which allows us to keep levels of unhealthy bacteria low and it helps us to fight off infection and it acts as a bit of a bactericidal and keeps us from having problems um, with picking up urinary infections and so on. And our body works to keep the pleasure tissues healthy as well. So we get nighttime reflex erections that most women aren't aware of, but it, it flushes the spongy tissue through at night, keeps it healthy, keeps it responding, keeps the sensory nerves that help us to feel pleasure working really well. And I've just put, because I wasn't really taught the extent of the clitoris, even at med school, I think I was told that we only knew from MRI studies in 2005, the extent of the clitoris in women. It's, just, yeah. it's shocking. Yeah. So most of us are sort of aware of the little bit at the top, which is the glands, and that's equivalent to the glands of the penis. And it's got really dense nerve endings, but it actually extends into arms and bulbs much deeper and much more extensively through the vagina. And, and it's spongy tissue and it has to be kept healthy with blood supply. So as you go through menopause and that starts to change, we start to get differences in how we can feel pleasure. So menopause is, it's a process. It's not, you know, the, the word menopause is about your last period and it's something that you only know in retrospect, but the process goes on for, you know, some, some people say three years, some people say seven years. And we get these big fluctuations in estrogen levels and we get changes in our progesterone and testosterone levels too. And it works towards a, an eventual sort of falling off of estrogen and we lose androgens, the testosterone-like um, chemicals as well over time. And these have all sorts of impacts in different parts of our bodies. So it certainly impacts our brain pathways and our sort of innate interest and receptivity to sex can alter. The biological bit of that can alter. It changes blood supply to breasts, sensitivity of nipples, erogenous zones that we've previously enjoyed can start to feel different. 
and we get less blood supply down to our pelvis and vagina and bladder and pelvic floor. So all the bits that you guys talk about a lot in, in VPS, yeah. all of the um, the blood supply to that area changes too, which means that the turnover of cells reduces. It means that the bladder gets much thinner. Um, the, the sphincter, the sort of muscular control that keeps your, your urine where it's meant to be gets weaker pelvic floor muscles get weaker, clitoral tissue can shrink, it all sounds kind of miserable, lots of changes can happen that can really impact us and we lose our nerve sensitivity too, so that male bodies also lose some nerve, nerve sensitivity in their um, sexual function as they get older but ours kind of accelerates at this point because of the changes in our hormones. So what are the consequences of this? Well, you know, I've, I've sort of done a ring of fire in the corner, but it can really change um, how sex feels. The women that I see in clinic are complaining of pain. They complain of loss of lubrication, itch and dryness. The skin can become so damaged and thin that it can actually tear under your, you know, under your fingers um, when it gets really advanced. We experience problems with bladder function and increased urinary tract infections. And pleasure reduces because we get less sensations. So we can have, um, it can be much more difficult to become aroused. It can take longer or even be impossible um, to achieve climax. So all of these things start to really impact on, on women. And the stats for it are roughly um, as it shows here. So about half of women will tell us that they've got low desire. About a third of women will say that they've lost lubrication. And the figures on painful sex, and again, people don't really complain as much to us about it as they're actually experiencing it but these are really common changes and I find that women have often suffered for many years before I see them in clinic which is why again I, I wanted to get the information out there to, to try and help people to understand you can do something about it but menopause doesn't happen on its own it happens in the context of many of us being in middle age obviously it can happen when you're younger but it can happen when other things are starting to impact your body as well so we often see more bladder problems around this stage of life, some of them related to the loss of estrogen, but some of them just to do with getting older. Um, recurrent infections can become a problem, changes in the way that the, the bacteria that live in the vagina, the odour of the vagina is quite common. There are other health conditions, so anything that impacts nerve function, um, anything that impacts blood supply like di you know, diabetes, MS, and other mm. mental health conditions that can become more prevalent at this point too. So women experience lots of mood change at menopause, lots of PMT, PMDD, so sort of progesterone sensitivity can get much more profound. Um, mm. Anxiety, depression, all those things can become a sort of real melting pot for sex to become problematic at this stage. And interestingly, partner health is the single biggest impact on women's sexual satisfaction scores. So it's not just about what's happening in your body. It's also about the body of the person that you're sexually active with. And we do work in um, the private clinic. We've, we've got involved in doing some voluntary work with Maggie. So I'm quite interested in talking about cancer because I think as a big group of women, um, an increasing group of women that are surviving cancer and they are often left with sexual dysfunction and, and if we don't talk about women at midlife having sexual problems we really don't talk about this group of women so mm -hmm. sexual problems are the third most prevalent issue when you go through and survive um, cancer treatment and it's the it can it can persist for a long time into your survivorship um, and what I find sort of sh shocking about it really is that Although we know that probably 50 to 60 percent of people are going to experience problems with their sexual function after they go through cancer, we talk to about two thirds of men about this, but we only talk to about or less than a third of women. So there's a real disparity in being offered the conversation and being offered the sort of the, the information and the chance to talk about it. So. I just wanted to use the chance tonight to say that, you know, induced menopause happens a lot with cancer treatment. We damage ovaries, we use chemotherapy and it can plunge women into um, an early menopause. And in addition to that, we often then say that they're not able to have HRT. Um, certainly we have to sort of really think about it. So it makes it much more difficult for some of these things to be counteracted. And it's not just about the direct changes that you get of menopause in the vagina and the vulva. There are also changes to bodies. So women recovering from surgery like mastectomy or from radiotherapy treatments that can impact the vagina and shorten it or scar it. Um, 
we get changes even in things like our saliva for kissing and our touch for you know for, for using our body for sexual function chemotherapy mm. affects those nerves mm. so it's important to recognize it and to say that it's okay to talk to somebody about it and there there is an option to self-refer to charities like maggie's who will work with women who are going through problems like this and support them in getting access to treatment so i think it's really important to mention it doctors like me um, often unknowingly prescribe lots of medications to women at this stage too, which can really impact on sexual function. So in both um, partners, whether they're male or female within a, a sexual relationship, these drugs can impact on sexual function. So again, just to raise awareness that antidepressants, blood pressure drugs, painkillers, hormones, all of these things can act in a menopause-like way or they can impact the wiring and the blood supply that's involved in our sexual functions. So you've got to look at all of this when mm -hmm. someone says sex is hurting or I can't get, you know, I can't have an orgasm or my libido's gone. The, when you, you mentioned uh, prescribing more antidepressants, mm. um, but is there any evidence that antidepressants that uh, menopause is, is helpful? or are they being prescribed for something else? Yeah, um, so they, access to HRT is improving, I think, but still there was a point where HRT was, we were really frightened of using it. There are a couple of studies that, that gave us more worry about breast cancer than we needed to have. And at that point, I think it changed a lot of prescribing habits and women started to be given antidepressants when they had hot flushes and mood changes rather than being given HRT. And it's kind of twofold. The NICE guidance is really clear that if you have menopausal symptoms or menopausal mood change, you need HRT first and foremost, rather than antidepressants. You should treat the, the underlying cause. But antidepressants also impact on sexual functions. So they suppress libido, they make it more difficult to climax, um, and they are associated with something called post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. There are some people that get numbness persistent numbness um, after using and stopping the medications. So from my perspective, doing the work that I do, I would absolutely always talk about hormone treatment rather than using SSRIs unless I'm not able to, to do that with somebody. Okay, thanks, Sandra. It's okay. So libido, I'm just gonna talk about libido because I get asked a lot about testosterone. And I think mm. a lot of women think that testosterone will fix libido. So I'm going to just tell, I'm going to give a bit of information um, about the science of sex, really. So testosterone is really important. It's like a, it's a key female hormone. We make three to four times testosterone than we do estrogen in our 20s. So it's a big part of our hormone mix, even though we have about a tenth of the male level. We make it in our adrenal glands and we make it in our ovaries. And as we go through menopause, our ovaries take over some of that um, production. And over time, it gradually sort of peters off and, and we lose um, testosterone. But it's really important if your ovaries are removed or if they're damaged, you will get a sudden and abrupt loss of testosterone. And this can have really big impacts on sexual function, on desire, but also on the wiring and the sensitivity of the tissues. So it, ha it happens at sort of multiple levels. Um, so just flagging that if you've gone through something like that, that it's quite likely that you've got a handbrake on when it comes to your sexual response and you might really benefit from, we give oestrogen first, we have to give enough oestrogen and I'm talking more about HRT a little bit later on, um, but testosterone can be really important. However, libido is really complicated and it isn't a case of just giving women this drug and, and you know, juicing them up and off they go. It works very differently. So. I always ask women what came first with sexual problems. Was it the loss of libido or has that followed on from the fact that it's not rewarding or it's painful? And we have to be curious. I tried to get these question marks the right way around and I have no idea why they've stayed backwards. But anyway, <laughs> and this I did this last week at the IPM. I was trying to say that all of these um, things that can go wrong with sexual function interlink so it's impossible to work out what went first because as soon as you have vaginal dryness well then sex becomes uncomfortable and therefore you don't want to do it so it gets really circular and that's before you throw in self-esteem and anxiety and relationship issues and your aging parents and your you know everything else that gets in the way and there were sex scientists in the 50s and 60s that try to sort of map how sexual desire works and just briefly to kind of understand libido we were taught that it goes, you get excited, you get into a plateau of excitement, you have an orgasm, and then you're back down to baseline again. 
And then somebody called Helen Kaplan came along and said, but actually that you've got to have desire to get excited first. So she gave this idea that you have to have this sort of key bit at the beginning. But what I often think I see in clinic is this idea of a circular model of desire. And this was there's a lady called Rosemary Basson who studied particularly women in long term relationships who were often the group that we're talking about when we're talking to midlife women about desire. And without getting into the nitty gritty of it, she came up. She, what she tried to say was that desire can come before or after arousal. So sometimes we start feeling good and it's that that makes us kind of um, get our desire for sex. And that we have spontaneous desire, which is that kind of feeling of urgency or being in the mood that is really characteristic at the beginning of a relationship. But we also have responsive desire and it's equally powerful. And responsive desire is somebody starting to um, to give you some sexual stimulus of some sort. And that can be anything from, you know, direct touch to um, the setting or, the, or a smell or music or whatever it is that sort of gets you to start to think about sex. And as you start to feel arousal, then your desire can, can kick in. And it's this idea that if we get the right stimulus, but, but really importantly, in the right context, and we have that kind of willingness, then we can enter our sexual arousal in lots of different places. And that some of the time we're having sex for what she called approach motivations. So sort of positive reasons like wanting intimacy, want, because we're attracted, because we want physical pleasure. But that for a lot of women, they're having sex because they're fearful of losing something. So losing a partner or not feeling loved. So all of this is really important. And I often have to remind women that we're not, this is built on the idea that we're sexually neutral. But if we're having relationship issues or if we expect pain or we feel worried about our body image or worried that we won't lubricate and, we, and things won't work properly, then we're not neutral. Actually, we've got the brakes on because we're quite nervous about getting into something that we think is, is going to be um, difficult or not work properly. This is a complex slide, but it's just the idea that you can get into a positive spiral or a negative spiral. So this is moving on to our identity and relationships. This is a lovely slide from the Relate series that looked at older people's sexuality, and I quite liked it because it was different images than we normally see. And I find that women's um, sexual identity is often challenged as they go through menopause because of all the sort of imagery we see around us that's heavily youth weighted and all the scripts that we have about aging and motherhood and, and the changes that we, I was talking to a lady the other day about, you know, developing brow lines and saying, we don't say, great, here comes the wisdom and everyone's going to know how clever I am. We know we sort of, we don't feel like that about these things because, and this challenges women, women find it hard sometimes to feel sexy at this stage of life and we are bombarded with um, pictures that can make it really difficult. So it can be a tricky time. Um, and we're also experiencing a shift in our role. We're sometimes going from being parents of young children to moving to a different stage of life or experiencing the loss of a relationship. We might be experiencing the end of our fertility, which we might be grieving if we've had infertility. Um, so there's all these things that can be going on. And sometimes it can contribute to low self-esteem and shame feelings, which can act as a real distraction from sexual activity. We can have our minds somewhere else entirely. And it means that we haven't got attention on what's happening for us. And we know that all of these things make our sexual satisfaction scores lower as well. So we've got to look at the woman in context. It's not just what's happening in her body. Her mind can be challenged too. And relationships can be difficult in different ways. Long-term relationships, um, a lady called Esther Perel talks a lot about a paradox between needing to really know our partner and be really intimate with them, but the fact that desire often likes things that, that are unknown. Um, and, we, and we often find that there's something called the Coolidge effect, which is the idea that we save our, and it's chemically proven, we save our biggest sexual response, our biggest kind of sexual potency for a new partner, even if we have an existing partner at home. So men having sex after a heart attack are more likely to die if they have sex with a new partner than if they have it with their regular partner. And the same is the case for women. We just physiologically are wired to novelty and that can become a bit of a problem in long-term relationships. So we have to look at those things. And I find that when I talk to couples who are struggling with sex, it's become the elephant in the room. So they go to bed at a different time. They don't cuddle in the kitchen. They don't go on date nights. They, they don't communicate around it. And all of these things can be really upsetting and, and challenging for, for people as well. And we need to sort of talk about that. So what can we do about, I mean, it's a really depressing beginning, isn't it? <laughs> to, 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 the, um, to the sort of the problem. But I think the reason I talk about it is because it it's 
I see so much of it and I think I see the tip of the iceberg as well and there's lots that can be done to help if we recognize these things and we get in and we do something about it so Sometimes we have to be really curious and map what's going wrong. And that might mean, um, you know, the woman mapping what she thinks is going wrong as well. I've borrowed Karen Gurney's um, sexual response triangle. She's got this idea that you need three things for sexual response to work properly. You need your psychological arousal, your physical arousal, and you need to be staying mentally present. And I think it's a really nice um, sort of idea to, to hang things on. And I'm just going to try and build it up because I think it's all, yeah, here we go. So this is the idea that to be psychologically aroused, you've got to feel that you're, you're turned on, you're with a partner that you find arousing, you're in a situation that is something that you find um, an arousing situation in the right kind of context, um, and that you are able to be sort of mentally turned on. The physical side of things is that your body can work properly and that you can feel touch comfortably and that you can actually feel it because numbness can be a problem and that you can move and that you're having the kind of touch that you enjoy and you've got access to the kind of touch that you enjoy. The mentally present side of it is all of the distractions and women do a lot of this. We stay in our heads a lot of the time worrying about what we look like, worrying about whether we're going to respond, worrying about if it's going to hurt. And being aware of which of these things might be impacting on sex for you can be a really useful starting point to know what to do about it. So I talk to everybody about this as a baseline, and I'm sure that you talk about this a lot. But as the vaginal tissues dry out, as you go through menopause, you have to add moisture to them. You need to get into the habit of protecting them with moisturizers and emollients and checking the vaginal tissues for changes because it's it's probably your audience is quite aware of vulval cancers but actually I think a lot of my patients aren't aware that you can get changes like lichen um, and vulval cancers as you get older so I advise most women to change what they're washing with to a simple emollient, something like a um, epiderm or a, um, a sort of an eczema type cream. I, I saw a lady on Friday um, who works in London who often recommends using coconut oil because she pointed out that we don't want to smell of our eczema cream when we're having sex. And sometimes it's nicer to have things that... Um, that feel a little bit different. So you can use things like epiderm, you can use things like coconut oil, um, but it's important to stop using things that are foaming and soapy and will strip the tissues of their natural moisture. Mm -hmm. It's important to pat yourself dry after you wash because the tissues are quite delicate and to be gentle with the things that you put on yourself so use gentle detergents use cotton underwear um, and apply a moisturizer two or three times a week you can get um, proper moisturizers yes does a good um, vaginal moisturizer there are others and it's a good excuse for checking the tissues checking the labia checking that, that things don't feel thickened or sore or ulcerated and if you find something that isn't quite right making sure you take it to speak to somebody about Systemic HRT is probably a whole other webinar, but I guess the key point in it is that there are very few people that can't have it and it can be an incredibly important thing to have. And there was a study done a couple of years ago that looked at about 30,000 women who had had combined HRT and 30,000 that hadn't had it. And it looked at all the causes of death, not just breast cancer, but all of the things that can go wrong. And it showed 9% less deaths in the HRT group. So when we look at women as more than just people who can get breast cancer, but look at them as women who can get heart disease and stroke and diabetes and dementia and all the other things that can go wrong as we get older, um, for a lot of women, HRT is gonna offer more protection than harm. Mm. And HRT risk, everybody worries about breast cancer risk. I mean, breast cancer, I think, is the seventh um, lowest cause of death in the UK. So by far, women are much more likely to die of cardiovascular disease. And if you get to stage one breast cancer, you're still more likely to die of heart disease than you are of your breast cancer. But even when you look at breast cancers and what happens with HRT, there's a big difference between um, giving women synthetic progestins, so the, um, the chemically produced progestins, then giving them ones that are natural, like the micronized progesterone. So the stats on um, breast cancer involve, they need to be picked apart. 
and there's a gold and sort of a standard, a gold standard for HRT, which is to have it through your skin as a transdermal estrogen and use mm -hmm. a body identical estrogen and to have um, micronized progesterone, which is the body identical progesterone. And that's widely accepted and understood as being the lowest risk option and the safest in terms of things like um, it doesn't confer any blood clot risk. It, you know, it's, it's much more to well tolerated. So women need to fully understand the pros and cons and, and often are much more afraid of breast cancer than they need to be. The, the risk is um, much, much lower than they normally anticipate it. And it's in line with similar sort of lifestyle risks like having a large glass of red wine daily or, you know, if um, we see an increase that's equivalent to that sort of lifestyle change. So it's important to put it in contact in context and it's very protective. We've got a comment here from someone who says they're allergic to oestrogen and okay. um, an allergic reaction to hormones. <clears throat> and they use a, a moisturizer, they use yes and painkillers and have pelvic yeah. physio. Are there any other options? There's, I mean, I haven't come across many people that are sort of specifically allergic, but there are there are histamine reactions that can worsen yeah. with HRT. And one of the ways of getting around that sometimes is to be super cautious with dosing and to go very slowly and to use antihistamines. Mm -hmm. But if you're somebody that is um, really intolerant of estrogen, then we use non-hormonal medications to help with some of the worst symptoms of menopause. So um, one of the ones I use the most is venlafaxine, which is a it is an SNRI. So it's um, it works in a similar ways to SSRIs, but that can be in about two thirds of women. It can reduce hot flushes and it can improve mood and sleep. And we use oxybutynin, um, which is an anticholinergic drug. It, it's a drug that is usually prescribed for bladder problems. But because it impacts on how we sweat and that sort of pathway, um, it can be exploited right. with women in menopause and that can be really useful. So there are lots of other options and phytoestrogens, um, so some of the soy and flax and so on um, might be things that are more useful for you as well. OK, great. Um, we were talking about emollients and moisturisers and someone mentions um, there's an really this is about finding what works for you yeah. um someone mentions olive and bee cream for dryness and sex would, would you re recommend it so my general rule is that you want something that's super plain because we can sensitize and and we can get reactions to things that um that have fragrances and other ingredients in them but you're right it's about finding what's right for you i i know that um Dr. Frodsham swears by um, coconut oil for her patients. I, I personally use things like epiderm and, and vaginal moisturizers. There's no right or wrong. It's it's very much about what suits the individual. Um, but be be cautious of anything with fragrance and and colours and scents mm. because they tend to make you more likely to sensitise. Okay. Another question following on from the oxybutynin. Oxibut oxybutynin. Yeah. Oxybutynin. <laughs> what what dose would you suggest to reduce sweating if HRT is not an option? Um, I normally start at five milligrams, but yeah, there are people that use higher doses than that. Like all of these drugs, because they work, they're anticholinergic. They work on the whole system. You'll often get unwanted side effects, and the dose is sometimes limited by whether you get a really dry mouth or whether you feel that you get drowsiness. Mm -hmm. Any, I always say to patients, anything that does something that I want it to do can do something that I don't want it to do as well. So we've got to sort of really map what's happening um, and whether it's suiting you overall. But it's it's probably the one that I use the most now. In, in the women that I talk to at Maggie's, for example, we often go to that as a first line. Brilliant. OK, I'll go on to the next one, I think. If I can get it, yeah. Oops, I've gone too far. Here we go. Just to, just a note about breast cancer, just to sort of to say that the the evidence base is quite unclear and some of the always and never rules are perhaps not as always and never as we thought they were. So, um, for example, in the clinic that I work in, if and the nice guidance is if you've got somebody with a BRCA um, gene mutation, so this is the, the, the gene that can make you genetically very prone to developing breast cancers, well, actually, those women are encouraged to have HRT if they have risk-reducing surgery up to the age of 51. If you've had a previous breast cancer, then it's important that we understand the hormone receptor status of the cancer. 
But for women that have had a hormone receptor negative cancer who've got very difficult symptoms of menopause, then many oncologists will consider that HRT can be thought about. It is an option for some of those women as long as we work in conjunction with the oncologist. And even for women who've had hormone receptor positive cancers, the, actually the evidence is much less clear than you would imagine. Um, there's a study that's coming out in the next couple of months that's a systematic review looking at all of the research that's been done about HRT and breast cancer and recurrence. And it's much more positive than you might imagine. So the general rule is still that we would try lots of non-hormonal alternatives and we would always want to talk to the um, oncologist about it. But sometimes they will consider it in conjunction with a drug like tamoxifen that blocks breast tissue. It's a, it's a shared decision making um, option. So you need to really understand the pros and cons and it has to be put into the context of how difficult life has become with your hormone loss, because for some women it's devastating. Um, and actually the topical vaginal vulval HRT, so options of putting estrogen just locally to the vagina and vulva are becoming much more common and widespread in women who've had that kind of background. So we're shifting a bit and understanding that, that we can't look at a woman as only the breasts and the breast cancer, that actually her heart health, her bone health, her risk of diabetes, all those things are incredibly important as well as quality of life. Mm. In topical HRT, I often quote some guidance by the British Society for Sexual Medicine, which came out, I think, about a year ago. Um, and they did a consensus statement on genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And it's full of references to all of the research and data. So because the, the license for the products that we use often suggests that they're used in quite low dose, so just for two weeks and just internally, and then you reduce it right down and then you should stop it. And I think people still get very doctors that are quite nervous about it, but the safety data is strong. And if you use one of these products in full dose for a, you know, for a year, you'll only absorb as much as is contained in one single one milligram tablet of HRT orally in a year. So you absorb mm. so, so little. And my guidance um, to patients is that they shouldn't just treat themselves internally. It's not just about preserving penetration. It's about mm. preserving the skin on the outside and using the vulval estrogens externally too. Um, so these are things that, you know, the, the symptoms return when you stop within six weeks. It's really important to consider this a lifelong um, mm. thing to do and to use as much as you need. And it is even safe for those on tamoxifen. And some women on letrozole will have conversations with oncologists and, and you know, be able to come up with a way of doing this safely. So um, it's to put it on the table for people. And then my funny pictures are funny things, but um, sometimes if you've had vaginal narrowing or shortening on the back of things like radiotherapy, using dilators can be useful, but the NHS dilators are miserable. They are solid and straight and not curved like women's bodies. So you can get these nice inspire dilators and there are other brands, but um, and these can be paired with a bullet vibrator so that they can produce them. And then there's evidence that if you use vibration on the tissues, it actually helps to encourage blood supply and to, um, to make things improve more quickly. We sometimes recommend using vibrators and clitoral suckers, which is that sort of green thing on the, um, on the side, which can intensify sensation because we can, for lots of reasons, we can lose sensation to our, our sensitive tissues. And then the ONUT, I think, is a genius um, thing that I don't know if you're aware of, um, but it's a set of rings, stretchy um, silicon rings that can be worn on the penis or on whatever is penetrating to allow control over depth of penetration, which means that if you've got shortening from radiotherapy, if you've had surgery, um, it's a way of including some penetration as part of your repertoire and doing that safely. And there's also um, clitoral stimulants as well. So there are... Um, sort of substances that can help to sort of improve blood supply and, and help sensation for those that find it more difficult. And I think my click is not working very well. Is that the end? I think that's, it stopped working at my end. It doesn't want to go into the next. There we go. There was one more book. It just went a bit slow. So um, this slide was just things that, because I'm, I'm trained to do lots of therapeutic sessions with patients, but I work in the NHS and I often don't get the time to do the, the, the sort of work that I want to do. So I've come up with a list of things that I talk to patients about. Um, so there's some books on the top there that are really useful if you're wanting to understand more about female sexuality and things that can alter it. Um, there's the Squeezy app and the Furley app, which are really good for pelvic floor exercises and um, looking at female sexuality. Same with OMG Yes website. It's a really good website for helping women to understand more about how their bodies work. 
And you can get help from places like Maggie's, uh, Relate and COSRA and, and the Institute of Psychosexual Medicine, or people like me that, that sit across um, all those areas and can look at your medical issues and menopause, as well as what's going on with sex as well. So I can be NHS referred to um, if you're in the sort of Hull area, but we also work online. There's a QR code for their website on there. And then I think, whoops, I've lost you. It's okay. You Hold can still on. hear me, but I seem to have lost. Hang on, let me come back on here. I've got you again. There we go. I just clicked something. Was that the end end of your slide? That's the end of my slides. The next one just says that I'm I'm I can take questions if people have got questions. Fantastic, brilliant, Angela. That was so fascinating. We had lots of comments here from people really appreciating the content, and someone said, "I'm going to be sharing this far and wide." <laughs> So, <clears throat> listen, if you do have any questions, please just pop them in the comments or chat box. Um, <clears throat> as we're I'm just going to have a quick scroll through to see if there's anything mm. that I've missed here. Or someone just saying this is brilliant. Thank you from a, a pelvic health physio um, and saying I can't stay to the end. So good to know I can re-listen and share from from YouTube. You can. And, you know, if you have missed any part of this and I know because on some of the slides there was a lot of information yeah 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 absolutely I encourage people to re-watch so they can pause as you go along and, and take more of the information um so if you missed any part of the live stream or you want to re-watch which I would absolutely recommend um you can do that uh and all of our events are uh, all our live streams are on our Facebook um page and I'm just going to pop that in the comments box now as I've been chatting I think I've seen uh something come in oh just people just saying absolutely brilliant great talk great talk thank you so much so interesting um listen you don't get the chance to have Angela here um very often so if you do have any questions now would be the time to ask um any oh Thinking about a take home point, if there were top three take home points okay. um, for our viewers and listeners, what would they be? I mean, I guess one of my big bugbears is that most women's bodies are not broken. I think that women women are told that they should work in a different way and that they should respond to sex in a different way than actually we're designed to do so I think that would be I mean it's it's not a particularly menopause related one but as a broad one um, women's bodies in the right circumstances usually work brilliantly and it's just that sometimes we're not in the right circumstances I guess the second one would be to not underestimate the significance of the change in your body and in your brain when you go through menopause and as part of that to not overestimate the risk. I see women that are really frightened of going on to HRT. They've sort of just got it in their system that somehow they should soldier on and they should grit your teeth and, and it and it's yeah. sort of there's a prize or a badge for getting through it um, with green smoothies alone. And I'm not, you know, I, I just think you need to really understand that it, it is a safe, well recognized treatment that can have really profound impacts. And it's about not just about the symptoms as you go through, it's about your risk of health problems as you get older and being independent and active in your retirement. So whatever you decide to do, gen up on it, read up on it, really understand the pros and cons and then make a decision on the back of that. And I guess, you know, the final thing would be a plea for vaginal estrogens, even in those that don't necessarily want to go for systemic HRT, just to really understand, again, the profound impact of the things that we expect as part of aging and that we just say are part of getting older. So vaginal prolapse, recurrent urinary tract infections, itching and dryness and dermatitis, um, you know, the, the, the frequency and, and the sort of continence issues that women experience as they get older. These these sort of normal bits of aging are hormone mediated parts of aging mm -hmm. and they're preventable and they cause quite a lot of low level misery to women. And I'm a big advocate for being proactive about it. That I think it's something like 10, 10 to 70%, they say, of women on systemic HRT will still experience vaginal and vulval problems. But my view is that that's the data that we draw this from is not 
it, it, I don't know how accurate it is because I don't think women flag it. They don't report it. They don't say that they're just getting a bit of itch that's waking them up for half an hour at night time. And it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a low level misery. So I think we see the tip of the iceberg and these treatments are very well established, very, very well understood. And the topical treatments are barely absorbed systemically and can be a game changer. So I guess that would be my three take homes. Brilliant. And as you've been going over those three, we've had a few questions uh, come in. Spotted one here about, I get very hot feet, which can keep me awake for hours at night. Any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, it's the vasomotor symptoms of menopause. We didn't go into lots of the others. I've gone a bit sex heavy tonight rather than menopause heavy, but um, hot flushes. Uh, to do with the, the blood vessels dilating everywhere and it's to do with the there's an area at the back of your brain called the thermonuclear um, zone and it's monitoring how hot you are and it's taking steps to cool you down if you get too hot and it will be more than likely to do with that process so you know at the risk of sounding like a broken record the the simplest thing to do if you're suitable for it would be think about HRT if you're not there are simple things you can do. I'm trained in menopause CBT, which talks about doing simple things like paced breathing, just bringing your breathing down to six breaths a minute. Um, let your brain recognize that your body is calm. And so it sort of turns off a lot of the fight flight mechanism, which is how it does a lot of the sort of menopausal changes like palpitations and things. And all of those things can help you to gain control over those symptoms. But the hormones are the key. Okay, we've got a couple of um, questions on, on vulval pain. Uh, vulval pain, hypertonic pelvic floor and being prescribed amitriptyline, how long um, before you would see an improvement? Varies, um, because it's to do with dosing as well. So it's about titrating up if your um, if your symptoms and side effects allow you to do so it's making sure that you're on an adequate dose and these painkillers well you you know this inside out but they, they they work differently they remodel how your nervous system is working and they and they sort of dial down the pain signal and and there's also lots of associated pain behaviors that we get when we've been living with chronic pain that, that you need time to to calm as well so I'd normally give women a good three, six month trial of these medications um, if I could do. Yeah. And remember, Angela was talking earlier about the biopsychosocial model. And yeah. that is absolutely appropriate when we're talking about vul vulval pain as well. Um, vulvodynia, vaginismus, I think someone has, has mentioned as well. Um, you know, we're treating the whole person 100%. rather than... The yeah. old biomedical model yeah um and we do have some webinars and live streams that we have have covered that so i will put up another link uh to all those live streams uh, in a short while any gems on neuropathic painkillers for vulvodynia or treatments of vaginismus that can be helpful so i think vaginismus i I think is we need to be really curious about what is going on with it because I often think vaginismus is a very logical response to continuing to try and do something that might bring pain without having necessarily addressed the un underpinning factors so I tend to take a lot of time with my vaginismus patients to be really curious about what started what you know, what's going on here what's happening in terms of how you feel in your body um, but the painkillers when, when we come down to doing sort of Bio, biological things and using painkillers it's the same old um, culprits that we talk about a lot of the time I tend to start with medications I prefer amitriptyline's side effect profile to some of the side effect, side effect profiles on things like the gabapentinoids mm. um, so I tend to use them more in patients I tend to be more cautious about using SSRIs and SNRIs because I've got that sexual sort of focus lens going on um, but I do quite a lot of psychosexual work with both presentations, actually, because again, I think the scripts about sexuality, um, about what we're supposed to be able to do with our bodies and what touch is supposed to be okay versus what actually is, it can be really useful to explore that. Yeah. Um, we could have a whole another webinar or a live stream on, on that topic. Yeah. Um, so let's just wrap up here with a couple more questions. I want to use HRT uh, vaginal cream, but I think I'm becoming sensitive. It was the same with pessaries. Any advice or suggestions? 
Yeah, so they they can be, and, and actually the applicators are, you know, I feel like they've been designed by a bloke. They're straight and scratchy and a bit miserable to to put in. So oh. um, you do have to play around with different products. Um, some of them have got different bases and excipients, which you can just, you can develop sensitivity to. Um, there's the S string, which I quite like, which is like a flexible curtain ring, which doesn't sound particularly enticing, but you can use that for up to 90 days. It's not messy. You don't tend to react to it. And that can just be pushed up into the vagina and it stays there. I often start people off with a vest in cream because there's a point where the cells have to kind of heal and get a bit stronger. And so we're often a bit intolerant to some of the other products before that happens. So mm. I often start people on a vest in get that bit done and then move them on to maintenance but there's lots now there's been um quite a few new players that have joined the market recently there's you know um in vagis or i am vagis depending on how you say it there's presterone which is new there's blissell there's you know lots of new products that you can cycle through and hopefully you'll find something that you can tolerate okay brilliant um, the question here, what's the risk of HRT in patients with endometriosis controlled um, intrauterine with IUS but pelvic lesions? Would HRT affect this and bring back pain? We need to be careful to use progesterone and adequate progesterone. So if you consider that the estrogen is like the bricks of the womb lining and the progesterone is like the mortar, you've got to get a real balance between the two. And the key thing in endometriosis is adequate progesterone um, and tracking with the patient whether or not they're getting any waking up of those um, sort of lesions or that pain. But we treat we treat people with endometriosis with HRT all the time. It just potentially needs a specialist eye. Brilliant. I'm sure I saw one more here. Let's have a look. <clears throat> um, oh, someone just asking what is gabapentin? Um, I was given estriol cream that caused a reaction. I've gone natural. What is gabapentin? Gabapentin, that's it. It's a long conversation. It's um, it's a painkiller that affects the sort of gabinergic pathways in the body. And I don't know how else you'd explain it, really. It just it modifies the way that signals are sent. And um, in terms of going naturally, um, I would encourage you to do potentially what I said to the lady. There's there's different presterone is different in, in is the building blocks of your body will take it in and turn it into estrogen and progesterone and um, testosterone like compounds so if you can't tolerate estriol you might be able to tolerate prasterone or you might manage with an estering um, so if you want to try again it might be worth doing that there are a few options there brilliant I think we've covered all the questions that have come in this time and I've got a feeling Angela we're going to be bringing you back in because the room filled up with viewers <laughs> and lots of positive comments here so Thank you so much for for coming on again. Um, or someone, someone's just quickly asked, can, can after a while come off amitriptyline for vulvodynia? Um, so my view on using these painkillers is if you've, if you've achieved being pain free with them for a number of months, and sometimes I cautiously start to reduce, but it, it varies again with the patient and the circumstances and what we think the cause of, you know, if we have any idea about the cause or whether it really is idiopathic and we don't know. Um, so, yeah, I, it very much varies between patients and stories. Yeah. And I guess motivation for coming off it as well. Some people feel like they ought to come off things and they don't necessarily have to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if it's working for you. And again, remembering that biopsychosocial approach yeah, exactly. is not just one thing. Um, Thank you so much, Angela. And if you missed any part of this live stream and you want to rewatch, I've put both the uh, links up so that you can watch either on Facebook or YouTube. Um, completely up to you where you want to to replay or watch watch it from the beginning. Now you might be able to hear that I'm slightly under the weather. <laughs> um, Yes, it's it's what you're probably thinking. Um, and uh, as we'd advise to to anyone else, I am pacing myself. So <laughs> we will announce our next live stream across social media when I'm a little bit more recovered. Excuse me. <laughs> Talking about pacing. 
Many of you will remember Pete Moore from the Pain Toolkit, who we've had on twice to discuss practical strategies and supported pain management. Uh, Pete is running an online event mobilising the worldwide pain management community, um, and it's to support the people in the Ukraine refugees. Presenters include Professor Lorimer Mosley and David Butler from Australia, Keith Meldrum from Canada, David Poulter from the US, and I'll be there from the UK discussing how to introduce self-care strategies and healthy boundaries. Whilst the event was mainly for healthcare providers, clinicians, often people living with persisting pain find these kind of events really helpful. And of course, we can always learn from you being there and commenting and sharing your opinions if you can. So that event, Mobilising the Worldwide Pain Management Community event, is on Saturday the 23rd of April. It's 7.30 to 10 a.m. in the morning, um, 7.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the morning, BST. There will be a recording for anyone who registers it and can't make it that early on a Saturday morning. Um, minimum donation is £10. All donations go to the British Red Cross as part of the DEC Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal. And I just try to post up a link um but i will do so again if that hasn't gone up i think it has gone up okay so we are on twitter we're on facebook so do follow and keep an eye out as we will announce our next live stream via, via our socials thank you to all of those um who follow us um, already and share our tweets and our posts uh, because you're you know helping get resources and, and messages out to anyone living with vulval pain as as well as healthcare providers and clinicians and researchers and of course educating the wider public so it's really important and, and thank you so much for doing that that's all from us today thank you and oh someone said um wish you better so thank you for that <laughs> hopefully i'll be in, on better form next time that is all from us today thank you again dr angela wright gp clinical sexologist menopause specialist and thank you all for being with us live or on the replay bye for now see you next time cheerio bye